Your Bibles, please, and please give me your kind attention for the next uh, few moments to the Gospel of St. John, chapter number 19, verses number 25 through 27 is our text. And the message is entitled, What Did Jesus Do in Regard to his mother. I don't know if you've ever considered that or not. Uh, this is the third year that we've been in a theme entitled, What Would Jesus Do? And uh, you know, it's amazing that what he would do and what he would say touches every area of our lives if we will but allow it to. The Gospel of John chapter 19, if you have your Bibles open or are following our reading on the screens, the Bible said, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Mother's Day. Thank you for blessing my life with my dear mother that's now in heaven and has been for several years and those godly grandmothers that helped shape my life. Thank you. Thank you for giving me faith when I did not deserve such a one. And for her motherhood of my, my sons, thank you for giving me two precious daughters-in-law and their motherhood to the grandchildren. Thank you for all these dear ladies, family members and friends, in-laws that are mothers and good mothers and contribute to our lives. God, may this day be special for them. Uh, God, uh, I know my wife especially has a, has a hole in her heart this morning. Now, I'm praying that you would, you would fill that, that void, uh, and Lord, help us. And Father, most of all, if there's any dear mom here that is not assured of heaven, they've never personally trusted Christ, help them to make that eternal decision today. Moms that may be empty uh, and... Uh, not involved in constructive things in life. God help them to uh, see the value of getting involved in your church and the great contribution they can make to it and to your cause in the world. And Lord, the prayer I've prayed for mothers goes for those that aren't mothers, goes for the young ladies, goes for the gentlemen and all the boys, all of us. God, we we need you so desperately. So, Father, help me preach just now in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, in our churches in America and in other countries, we're celebrating Mother's Day. The observance started with the efforts of a lady named Anna Jarvis of Philadelphia. It was first observed 
in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and in Grafton, West Virginia, on May the 10th, 1908, well over a hundred years ago now. And for over a hundred years, uh, we have celebrated uh, moms. And without the holiday, I'm sure they've been celebrated the millennium before. The United States Congress made Mother's Day a national holiday in 1914. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday of each May to be Mother's Day. Don't you agree that is a good thing? Mothers are one of Earth's greatest treasures. Only eternity will reveal the great contributions that mothers have made to the world and that mothers have made to our churches in the world. Oh, how they've shaped the lives of men and women that have gone on to be renowned peoples in the world. Do you ever hear that saying? The hand that rocks the cradle, that's so true, shapes the men and women that shape the world. So today, we honor mothers. Obviously, my thoughts have turned to my dear mom. And if there's one thing I remember about mom always, oh, how she loved me how she loved her, her six boys and her daughter, and how that she would sacrifice anything and everything for her children. I think of the precious grandmothers that I was able to have up until at least in my early teen years. And uh, one of them into young adulthood. I was never privileged to see either of my my grandfathers, but those dear ladies helped shape my life. And I said in my prayer, I'm glad that God gave me the daughters-in-laws that I have and and my in-laws and and you great people in this church. And if you could see a pastor's heart this morning, ladies, I love you. Thank you. Uh, oh, listen, only, I can't tell you enough, but only eternity, if you'll just faithfully wait, patiently wait, only eternity will reveal your importance to the work of the Lord and your children. Here's my guiding thoughts for the message today. I have but three that they arise just naturally from the text. There's a mother's love and devotion. There's a son's love and departing instructions. There's a disciple's love and decision he makes. It's a good text, but uh, surely on a day like this, you've already been thinking about her mother's love and devotion, haven't you? Well, the text reminds us of that. Look, if you would, now there stood at the cross of Jesus. His mother and his mother's sister and Mary, the wife of Cleopas with them and Mary Magdalene. 
listen, the horrible, hellish, physical sufferings of Christ, a completely innocent man has culminated on the cross. And if you could just envision this with me just for a moment, please, hanging there in indescribable pain and suffering, blood running down his brow and burning in his eyes and covering his arms and his, and his body. And the anguish of the nails in his hands and in his, his feet. And, and, and as the psalmist said, all of his joints are out of socket and he's hanging there suspended on the, on the cross. And among those at the foot of the cross stood Mary. I'm sure that someone said, some of her, her, her children that had born, been born later, Mom, you, you don't need to, to see this. And maybe someone tried to tear her away, take her away. But Mom's not going anywhere. She's standing at the cross. And with her some dear ladies, her friends, family, there to support her the most trying time of her life during the greatest heartache experience of her. There they stand arm in in arm. And I just want you to to see that this demonstrates uh, clearly the love and the devotion of a mother. You know, some 33 years before this event, there was an old prophet named Simeon, a precious old man of God, went into the temple. The Holy Ghost of God led him into the temple and he went in and he took the baby Jesus up in his in his arms and and he blessed God the Bible said that he lived as long as he lived and he lived long enough for his eyes to see the promised Messiah and he spoke to the people about the great impact that this babe would have in his maturing years upon the world. And then, with a tear, I'm sure, caressing his cheek, he turned away from the audience to dear Mary, the, the young mother, And said to her, Mary, a sword will pierce through thine own soul also. And you see, I want you to understand that as Jesus is hanging on the cross, a sword is piercing the heart of Mama. Mama is sharing all of the suffering, all of the pain. All the horror of the cross. She's buried it in her soul and in her spirit. And you that are parents, dear ladies, some of you have watched children suffer and and die. And you've gone through that 
uh, those experiences of wishing with every fiber of your being that you could, you could do something for your son, or you could do something for your daughter, but, but you just, you just couldn't in the most helpless feeling in the world. I, I assure you, I, this old preacher man knows what he's talking about. The most hurtful sword piercing into the very soul of man and, and woman is to know that they cannot change things. Cannot help their son or their daughter. Oh, listen. But there stands mom. You can't turn her away from the side, her love and her devotion. Ladies, I commend you today for that quality that's more unique to you as a human being than it is even to the men. Oh, it's unique to you. No one experiences the sword in their soul like dear moms do. Oh, listen, no love on earth can compare to hers. Let me give you a little preach here. If you've got a mom and she's still alive, you better take time for her and tell her you love her and do something special for her. Spend some time with her because I promise you moms aren't forever on this earth and no, no one will ever replace mom. There's a son's love and departing instructions. Look at verse number 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple uh, standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Now, at first reading, you might possibly think that he's telling his mom to look upon him on the cross. But as you read the next passage, he isn't doing that. He he isn't turning his mom's attention to him. Listen, he's already got mom's attention. He's turning mom's attention to that beloved disciple John who's standing there now I'd assume that he had either his left or right arm around Mary and probably the other ladies and obviously they were all huddled up holding each other in their arms at the darkest time in recorded history, the crisis of the cross of Christ. Here's what we see. The Lord's sufferings, don't you agree with me, at this moment were so intense, so horrible, uh, so anguishing, so indescribably painful that it's a wonder if it was ever lucid enough or if he was ever aware, could even have moments of awareness. But yet he does. He expresses during this time not one bit of animosity toward his tormentors. Only the Lord 
It could be that way. But in Luke 23 and in 24, you're reading the scriptures and you look at all of the chapter following down through 34 and, and onward. Look at, at verse uh, 33 and 34. Others were making bad gestures and horrible remarks at him. But amidst all his sufferings, verse 34, he utters these words from the cross. Not one bit of animosity toward his torment. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. Father, forgive them. Not one bit of animosity toward his tormentors. And through eyes filled with blood, burning, he sees mom there at the foot of the cross. And he, he sees that mom's there. And, and John the beloved disciple is there. And, and the most remarkable thing happens at that time. He turns his attention to who? His mom. At the, at the moment when, when, when all the sufferings imaginable and all the sins of humanity hanging on the, on the body of Christ on the tree, he, he turns attention to mom. Let me inject this. You better take time to pay attention to mom. Turns his attention to mom. I'm sure she didn't want him to talk like that. She wasn't expecting him to say what he said at all. In fact, it may have hurt her feelings. When, when he started talking like that, may have made more tears gush from his eyes down his face when, when he started talking like that. But notice, if you will, he says, woman, and he asks Mary, Mary look over to, to John. Maybe John's already got his arm around her. Mom, look at, look at John's face. Look at him. Behold, thy son. Here's what we learn through tears in our eyes, through sorrow unspeakable. Here's what we learn. Life goes on whether you want it to or not. Mary must go on. Mary must find reasons to go on, reasons to live in her other children. And in a, a new adopted son that was going to be brought into her life. Now let me say something to you. I'm sure you'll understand. Sometimes you wish life didn't go on. Since October 16th, 
I wish life could just stop. Don't want it to go on anymore. Lost one of the two. All but lost one of the two things that mean more to me than the breath that I, 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 I breathe. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've struggled with, with, with going on, with life going on. And I know my dear wife is, honey. The message is for you today. Life must go on. You must reach to the depths of your soul and turn your eyes, that grandson, lay it over on your shoulder. And that man back there, his wife, those other kids. The Lord says life goes on. Turn your eyes upon John. Find a reason, Mom, to go on. God's got it all in his hands. Going on is not easy. But going on is essential. So she must find comfort and strength in, and reason to go on in John as well as her other children and family. Now let me, let me show you something perhaps you've never seen before. Why, you might be asking. Why, she had other children. Why, why John? Why? Mom, behold John. Why? Behold him as your son. Why? He's becoming your adopted son. She didn't need him as such. Because she already had some other children. Why was this transpiring? Here is the reason for that. Now listen very carefully to me. John represents the church. Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1. When God gets ready to show us an illustration or a picture of this church leaving the world to be joined with it, he calls John up to be before the throne of God to witness all the events of the coming tribulation. And John is a type of the church. Second. Uh, Corinthians 5, 19 through 20. We are in Christ's stead upon this earth. And we're ambassadors for Christ in his stead. He's no longer physically here, but he's left the church here. Every, listen to me, dear mom, every mother needs attachment to and faithful involvement in the church for many reasons. I could give you reason after reason after reason. But let me tell you perhaps the greatest reason for your children's sake, for your grandchildren's sake, for your loved one's sake. Your attachment to the church, your involvement in the church, you're, you're going home with John. You're, you're going home with, with John, the, the church. You're being a part of that. He, they're, they're adopted and you're in their family now. And you need that desperately, more desperately than I can tell you. And please don't take lightly the church. Uh, if you're not saved, get saved. If you're not involved in the church, make a holy decision today that you're going to be involved up to your elbows, as the old saying goes, in the church. You're, you're going to do something eternal. Listen, only one life will soon be passed 
Only what's done for Christ will last. Every organization, every institution, everything you get involved in in this world will stop at the grave. Only your involvement in the eternal organization, organism of the Lord's church will last. You go out here and say, I don't like church. You do it to your own detriment. Do it to your own family's detriment. The only thing I can tell you, if you don't like it, learn to like it. Can't get used to it? Get used to it. Get in, stay in. John said, come on, Mom. Mom went down and took a Sunday school class. Mom joined the choir. Mom got involved in a small group fellowship. Mom made for her friends the people of God. Lastly, I won't be much longer. You'll like this. We can't just preach to moms. We've got to preach to me. There's a decision A disciple's love and his decision that he makes. Now, look at that text once more. After telling mom, he said, now, uh, disciple, behold thy mother. Behold thy thy mother. Uh, And from that hour, from that hour, he, listen, that hour, he made the decision to do what God told him to do. He took mom home with him. Now listen, don't just pass over the surface of this passage without plumbing its depths. Here's what uh, attaches itself to the line we would drop it into the deep of the scripture. Oh, listen. This disciple willfully decided to do something that added to his already busy lifestyle. His family was already probably big enough. His family responsibility was already, already big enough. Listen, he decided, he decided to add to his already busy life. Now, secondly, this disciple extended his family ties and responsibilities to include an adopted mother who had other kids. And he could have said, well, she's got kids of her own. I ain't got time to to visit with her. I don't have have time to show her some kindness. She she got kids of her own. But you know, he didn't do that, did he? He didn't do that. He added to his busy life. Somebody said, if you want somebody to do something, ask somebody that's busy. But she added, he had it. Now, now listen. He took her at that hour to his home. Now I'm going to close the message at this point with four questions. I wish every man was in the auditorium. I don't know how many men we got out in the foyer. We're going to be going home in about five minutes. Can you open these doors? Can you go ahead and open these doors? I want to preach. If there's anybody out there in the floor, you're, I want them to hear me. Open his doors. Somebody open the doors. When the pastor tells you to do something, hop to it. Don't, I, I mean, don't act like you ain't listening. I, I mean, open the doors. Now listen, all you fellows, I want you to listen to something. This way we'll close the mat. We've preached to the ladies. Now I'm going I'm to ask you, I'm going to ask four questions of four people. As pastor, 
Am I doing my job making time to visit and help others? As pastor, am I making the time to visit and to help others? Now it's your time, deacons. As deacons, are we doing all our biblical job, Acts 6, and visiting and helping others? Has there been a widow that you've gone to visit and to pray with and to cry with and to tell them you love them? Ask them if they had any needs? You thought you had a great sermon going until I got to the end of it. Everybody would have met me at the Lord, Pastor, that's great preaching. As deacons, are you, are you doing the biblical job? Or are you just holding office? Pastor, are we just holding office? Preacher, are we just holding office? Or are we using office? Are we too busy being boss to be servant? As teachers, are we doing our biblical job? Are you reaching out to others? Do you ever contact the people in your class? Do you make time for them? Do you reach out? Oh, they don't need it. They're grown. They need it. Mary needed it. Are, are you doing your job? I just, I just want to teach. I just want to preach. Don't have to do anything. I'm just going to preach. I'm a good preacher. I'm going to tell everybody else what to do, but I ain't going to do nothing on myself. I'm going to go in that classroom. I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to teach them a lesson. Bless God, I'm going to give it to them. Look at them like that. Am I still your friend, teachers? Hey. Do you still like me? Hey. If you don't, you'll get over it. I'll probably, I'll probably, I'll probably be around when you're gone. <laughs> As Christians in this church family... Are you taking time for Mary? Are you letting the preacher do it all? Are you taking time for Mary? Are you standing with Mary at the cross? Is your arms around Mary when she needs you? Are you wiping a tear? from her eye when she needs you. Let's stand.